Welcome, neighbors, to this series we've named Talking with the Doctor. On the surface, it seems a simple thing. You visit the doctor, you tell him or her what's wrong, or what you think is wrong, or at least what is troubling you. He or she listens, nods, makes a few notes on the computer, asks a few questions, and proceeds to tell you what you need to know and what can or will be done to eliminate the problem. Sounds simple and routine, but it isn't. That first presentation of a health problem is very, very important. And there is never enough time for it these days, and all too often one or both participants in the conversation fail to make the best possible use of that too short time. That is what we hope to discuss and illustrate in this series of episodes, each of which features a healthcare issue or a major medical specialty. We'll talk about the problems of communication in each field. We invite you to join us. This episode of Talking with the Doctor will feature the following presenters. Dr. Betsy Moody, who is a specialist in geriatric medicine. She has served on the clinical faculty at Dartmouth, at Harvard, at the University of Massachusetts Medical Schools. And uh, she is currently our medical director in the Linden Ponds Medical Center in Hingham, Massachusetts. Nolara Lowe Steele, producer. Lowe is a professor at the Berklee College of Music in Boston. She's a former opera singer, long associated with Sarah Caldwell's Opera Company of Boston, a successful music educator of long experience, and she's recognized as the impresario of excellent musical productions and a television performer as well. Paul Gross is uh, a former, that is to say a retired academic, he was a professor of biology at MIT and at the University of Rochester and the Taylor Professor of Biology at the uh, University of Virginia where he was also the provost. Uh, and he was for 10 years the director of the MBL, the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. Center. It's so great to see you today. I know this is your first time here, so come on in. I'd like to introduce you to Janet Rourke. Janet's our lead front desk. This is where all the things happen, scheduling appointments, seeing the doctor, getting blood work, just making sure that everything works well. So she's our go-to person, and we love her here, and she's been with us a very long time. Hi. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Linden Ponds Medical Center. Let me show you what happens. Once you've made your appointment here at the medical center and you've talked to Janet, then we like you to come in and see the doctor. So it's really important that we get all your information and we know what everything is about you. The first thing we're always going to do is make sure that you, we get your height. You're probably going to say, why do I need my height? Well, you know what? It's really important for us to know what's going on, if anything's going on that we need to address. So we always get your height. And then we always make sure that we get, and I know this is not what you like to do, but we like to make sure that we get your weight. And we're really very fortunate. We have a great machine here if you're in a wheelchair and a walker or you just have some mobility issues. It's a nice walk-on. It gives the exact weight. It's digital. And the doctors love it. And we really can make sure that we're getting what we need to do. So that's the first steps of coming to the medical center and seeing us. Now there's two parts that might happen when you're here at the medical center. The first one is, is you may need to have some blood work done. And we love to make sure that if that happens, we have a full service lab that you can come in. If you're having a Coumadin check for warfarin, we can do that. If you're having a blood draw that you need to do, or if you're even having injections, um, an EKG, anything like that, we can make sure that that happens for you. So this is sort of our core work group for that. So lastly, if you're going to be seeing the doctor, let me show you our exam room. Our exam rooms are ready for you to come in and see the doctor. 
Um, we have everything here available, whether you need blood pressure checks, um, if you have some problems with your ears, um, you know, anything that you need to do, this is where it's done. We have an electronic medical record, so everything is on, on the computer. Um, and we can make sure that we can service you to the best of our ability. So welcome to Linden Ponds Medical Center, and we look forward to serving you. Dr. Moody, our viewers have already had the privilege of meeting you. Uh, that was in our introductory, in the introductory episode of this series. Uh, today, we have another purpose, and that is to hear about your specialty. Uh, the important specialty for our viewers, particularly geriatrics. And I think it would be well to begin with uh, a description, a statement of the specialty, what it means, what its purposes are, and then a few words about the educational pathway to becoming a geriatrician. Sure. Uh, I um, specialize in geriatrics and I'm board certified in both internal medicine and geriatrics. What geriatrics is, is a specialty that does take care of primarily the elderly, although age by itself is not a uh, determinant of geriatrics. We focus more on function and uh, quality of life. So the true definition is to uh, try to maximize the health and function, quality of life and happiness of uh, the older people. And so our training um, is beyond internal medicine and also family practice uh, residencies. Uh, there is training in geriatrics. And uh, there were, up until the early 1990s, people could take the first certification exam in 1988 with a background in working with the elderly in nursing homes. And uh, thereafter, it was required to also have at least a one-year fellowship in geriatrics beyond your training in internal medicine or family practice residencies. Taking the exam, also there's some stipulations of certain amount of, of uh, care of the elderly in your practice that would go into becoming certified as a geriatrician. And then we're recertified uh, every 10 years, as many other specialties are. So we have to sit for another exam and also oh. provide some other um, practice type of information that, uh, that we're still providing quality care to older people. Somebody um, has oversight, mm -hmm. in short that you actually know what you're doing in geriatrics. That's correct. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> right. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Moody, the, the main thrust of our series here is to talk about what doctors need to know from the patient. And we know that you get a lot of information from tests that are done. But specifically, we'd like to know what you want to know when the patient comes in. Well, I think particularly in geriatrics, uh, per your question, that the, the, the questions and the information we uh, receive from the patient and their caregivers is far more important than tests because it will give us the best idea of what the problems and issues have been, how somebody has been functioning, and this will guide us a great deal in terms of what tests we need to order. So the types of information that would be is most helpful uh, that people bring with them involves some preparation before the visit, doing some homework. Right, um, and uh, people of our generation were not used to doing that. Mm -hmm. they, we grew up turning it totally over to the doctor and we didn't even have to think before we went in. Now you would like for us to think about why we're coming in. That's correct, because it really needs to be centered on, on the patient for us to be the most effective, and the communication yeah. is a very important part of that. Uh, so some of the information that we need, uh, some of it's very factual, what medications that you're taking, mm -hmm. what surgeries you've had, what other medical problems you've had in the past, any allergies, sort of the traditional information that people gather, uh, thinking about how you are doing in your life uh, with uh, functioning at home, driving, those types of things are important things to think about ahead of time. 
Yes. I, I don't remember when we met before if we said we would put this in right now, but I'm always very curious about how much you want the caretaker to talk and how much you want the patient to talk if the caretaker comes with the patient. Well, I think the caretaker is very important and also I think that brings in another part of the planning ahead of time that whether you have a caregiver or if you're more independent, that bringing somebody with you is a great idea because it sometimes takes another set of ears to hear everything. Right. Yeah. But in terms of the, uh, the caregiver during the interview, I like to see the focus on the patient. So mm -hmm. if I perceive that there are some cognitive issues, I still try to direct uh, most of my conversation to the patient. Yes. Uh, it can happen sometimes that they become a third person and, and the communication goes ah, back and forth with the caregiver course. if you're not careful sometimes. Mm -hmm. But they need to feel included, answer some of the questions themselves, and almost ask permission of the patient to have uh, the caregiver give some of the history to, uh, to help fill in some of the, the blanks. So they so. should sort of go through that before they come to the doctor's office? It probably helps for them to have that conversation right. ahead of time that uh, the doctor may I, be I, asking I, me I, some I of this to, information. to follow up on that mm -hmm. because your colleagues uh, who, who, with whom we've talked uh, seem to, uh, at least so far, to agree that it's, it's particularly useful for the patient actually to write, to prepare a list of issues uh, which may be specified in advance or may not mm -hmm. be, but to include on that list not only the, the useful information that's needed, but also whatever they're worried about so that you get a sense of of what's animating the patient at the time of the visit. Yeah, I think that's very important. Uh, there have mm -hmm. been some more interest mm -hmm. in, in the medical literature as well as among uh, physicians uh, caring for, for people that it's important that you hear what the patient's concerns are because you're going to be most effective if you try to address those concerns. There's a, uh, uh, you've heard of white coat hypertension and there's also a term called white coat silence that sometimes, yes. again, due to the intimidating nature of the relationship yes. sometimes or the perceived intimidation uh, of a powerful physician that sometimes people are afraid to ask questions. So I think physicians are beginning to expect it more. So developing a list of questions, prioritizing them, Realizing that there, you may only be able to address the most important and defer some to another visit is very important. Yeah. Um, there are some, some sites that on the web that uh, help you to develop some of these uh, list of questions, yes. um, the types of things that would help guide you if um, you're having a little trouble coming up with the, the format these are, yourself. These are for the, for the patient? For the patient, ah. right. Yeah, the Joint Commission. Um, the, uh, there's a couple of other organizations, the American Geriatric Society, and uh, they're, very, they're very helpful to develop some questions that might guide you of, of asking, um, trying to get to the point of what, what your issues are. And we have here a list of things that you brought for the visitation process. Correct. Yes. So I wonder if we could put some of those up now on the, um, about the appointment. Yes, I brought some information on a bullet list of uh, before your appointment, uh, during the appointment, and after your appointment. Yes. So before your appointment is some of the things that we talked about already, and uh, I think the other point there is bringing a uh, a uh, pen, paper, or notebook. If you organize your healthcare information, it might be a good idea to write down your questions. If you need a translator, if a, a caregiver is coming with someone who is not as uh, fluent in, in English, it's a good idea to call ahead for a translator oh. because having an official translator uh, interpreter is, uh, is very helpful and in I terms of imagine. somebody who is, is used to the medical language that the physician might be 
might be using. So that's an important thing as so well. So going mm -hmm. back, that is mm -hmm. part of the preparation yes. for going to the doctor. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then the next one would be? So during uh, the visit, the first bullet here is, is to answer questions honestly. Now that doesn't mean that people are <laughs> dishonest <No. laughs> during their interview, but I think everybody Again, especially your first visit, you want to put your best face forward. You try to sugarcoat everything. Right. <laughs> so, and sometimes uncomfortable questions mm -hmm. are asked about different parts of your history, sexual history, alcohol, other types of habits mm -hmm. that the only way the physician can best help you with your problems is if those questions are answered honestly. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's a, that's a key and part. I to think the that visit. starts with mm -hmm. being honest with yourself first. Well, and that's true. That's part of the preparation. And, really <laughs> <right>. <laughs> uh, and then the uh, the other points are sometimes people's backgrounds, either cultural or religious, may impact how they want to be cared for. Sure. And so sure. it's important to mention that if you have particular foods in your culture are avoided, then obviously when the physician is making mm -hmm. nutrition recommendations, uh, that's going to make a difference in terms of uh, no, what- No, I'd never I'd, thought of that one. Yeah, so yeah, there, you know, there are important. different cultures that obviously, right. uh, or if you're vegetarian, that type of thing. Uh, getting some idea if you're very into uh, supplements and herbal types of medicine, alternative yeah. medicine, then yeah. you should mention that because it's something that's to address so that the uh, provider, physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant knows where you're coming from uh, when, yeah. when you're, sure. when you're um, yeah. meeting with them. Repeating back, and, and the physician or provider should should ask you to repeat back the understanding of an mm -hmm. explanation. If they don't, then say, well, let me see if I understand what you're saying right. and uh, yeah. try to repeat it back to them. And then ask for written instructions. So we, we do that where, where I am here at the medical center at Linden Ponds, and it's with the electronic medical record, it actually makes it very easy because we have then a written record of what we've told the patient, Yes. and they have written instructions. The patient uh, has a written in, record of what to do. That are in a little larger font as well, so that if they're yeah. visually impaired, then uh, that's, that's an issue. Not on this list, if you wear a hearing aid, please bring them. That's important uh, because <laughs> if we're going to communicate, you have You're to be able to, to hear us. You're speaking to people who wear them. And, Some and, of us and can't do anything without yeah. them. Right, and you can. If you think you're having hearing impairment due to something as simple as obstruction of something like wax or cerumen in the ears, <laughs> mention it. I mean, it's something people are embarrassed about, but we can communicate a lot better when you can hear. So that might be one of the first things to do is to make the hearing to be optimized. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. This all makes simple sense, but uh, it's important. I, we gotta, I think we must advertise, at least in our own place, uh, the existence of those, of those lists and make sure people right. can um, see them. I, perhaps at this point in time would like to mention the fact that our time with the physician is now much shorter than it was when we were children and so that time needs to be optimized and it be becomes much more useful if we have these lists if we have paid attention if we can hear what the doctor right. says mm -hmm. that right. helps mm -hmm. uh, all of these things really Help, would be very helpful within that space of time that we have with the physician. And I think the other thing is, as I said earlier, if you don't need to accomplish everything in one visit. And if there are issues that really should be pursued further and they deserve further time, such as cognitive evaluation, then you can have another appointment. Uh, again, it's, you don't have to squish it all into that one visit. Uh, yes. There tends to be a longer visit with the first visit with a, a physician, but but you can make follow-ups and have on the agenda other issues that there wasn't time to pursue right. or that did not have as prime importance. Occasionally at a visit, a doctor or a nurse practitioner will focus in on something that 
did not seem as important to you, such as some unusual chest discomfort that sure. you thought was nothing. So the visit might go towards addressing that. And so there has to be a little flexibility so that some of the other things will also be addressed, but understanding that they will be addressed at another time if there appears to be a more pressing medical issue that comes up during the first interview. Right. So. All of these things are mm -hmm. things that my, I may have the light bulb going on over my head as we speak. Things that we have really not talked about in the general public and, uh, and are very necessary to know in today's medicine mm -hmm. by yeah by the patient in relation to the doctor. And so the patient has gone to you see you, and now the follow-up. So the follow-up, uh, after your appointment, again, it doesn't necessarily end with the appointment. You may have tests to be done. You may realize you don't feel better still from uh, what you were presenting to the physician. The interventions didn't work. No. You may realize that you're having a reaction to a new medicine that the, the uh, provider has mm -hmm. prescribed, and of course you need to talk about that. And you might realize you forgot to tell them something. So you should have be able to have a relationship with your provider that you can call and say, I forgot this and I, I realized it's important and either to be dealt with in a telephone call or if another appointment is necessary to schedule sure. an earlier appointment. Betsy, you're an so. optimist. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm sure that works here, but it mm -hmm. is such a problem for most people to yes. actually to get through. Well, I think that there are some changes that need to be made in how yeah. medicine is practiced and, and it's, it's both sides in terms of the, the pressures on physicians to be able to see sure. a certain number of, of patients during a day and, and yeah. uh, so that, that definitely is a challenge for people and there's going to need to be some evolution of, of the process that will Right. Possibly more of a team approach uh, that will we'll in, get in to speaking addressing that. About in sp I'm sorry I interrupted, mm -hmm. but in speaking about medicine changing, mm -hmm. um, one of the the odd things that people of our generation are trying to get used to is the doctor sitting and typing at the computer, and what we forget is that when the doctor is looking at the computer. They're looking at us. They're looking right at them. Mm. But I have to congratulate you because this doctor is superb at typing and looking at the patient <laughs> themselves. <laughs> it is quite a remarkable thing to watch, uh, to watch that happen. I think I have to thank <laughs> two things. My high school typing teacher yes. and yes. my mother keeps putting me at the piano at age five is the ah. other thing that I think. Yes, leads so to that. So those should be the, two requirements for medical school, I believe. So. <laughs> right. Every every mm -hmm. doctor must take mm -hmm. piano lessons from the age of five. It won't work. Okay. It won't work. Well, but there's it might some, be a good there substitute. Is, there is some information in the literature too, some um, novel ideas to as more of the records being shared with patients mm -hmm. to actually include them, make it inclusive, turn the uh, computer screen to the patient and say, mm -hmm. this is what I'm writing in here, yeah. uh, this is what I'm doing, right. and, uh, and it can, it can, it will, it will engage somebody more and ex help explain what we're doing when right. we're typing into this mysterious medical record. You won't record. have to do that for the next generation coming up because they're computer savvy. Well, that's and, true and for, well, the <laughs> <laughs> for the most part. For the most part, right. They're savvy, but in the wrong way. They're, they're, they're just used to projecting themselves. And, and uh, games and so forth. But yes, everybody needs to know what a wonderful tool this is in, in the entire field of taking care of ourselves. It's a wonderful tool, I, the, but the information still needs to be what yeah. the information you need. It's the old uh, phrase, garbage in, garbage out. So that if you mm -hmm. don't really go for the information that's most important, then, and if it's not an electronic medical record that focuses uh, on the best way for 
providers to provide care, then it's not going to be helpful. And I've seen all types of electronic medical records, and some of them don't work very well in that way, and others mm -hmm. work very well mm -hmm. in terms of uh, yeah. being part of a process. So. Right. So it's more than just being computer savvy, it's being well, it's other savvy in order right. to put in the, cur the things that will right. be most helpful. Most important. Most important. Correct. Um, Paul, you were going to ask about the cognitive. I was, but I, I think I think I've already heard what most people will want to know. Uh, visiting the primary care physician, but especially visiting a, a, a physician they recognize as a geriatrician. Well, I think it's important to know that we also are evaluating cognitive function yes. more. Yeah. There's an annual wellness exam, and one of the requirements of it, it's a Medicare uh, category, is that we do a cognitive evaluation. Ah, okay. And so people might want to be expect that the physician, as a regular routine, will be asking questions about your memory. So it can sometimes feel intimidating to people when yeah. you start asking right. them questions about whether they remember the year, the this, the that, and, yes. and um, people may feel almost insulted. So there is a certain art to how you introduce that. But part of that is, is the provider making it clear that this is a normal another test that we do yes. as part of yes. the evaluation of, one of, of all your, of our patients. One of your predecessors um, here mm -hmm. made exactly that mm -hmm. point, uh, our psychiatrist visitor, yes. that uh, mm -hmm. the questions that are asked to assess cognitive function are uh, no more personal than taking some some blood by right. venipuncture. It's, it's just another measure. Any data. It's yeah. another measure and even uh, questions about depression. Uh, again, yeah. it's another tool that we use as part of this annual wellness exam, and it's another measure to see how people are doing uh, overall. Yeah. Speaking of the wellness program, mm -hmm. there is a, a workshop on falls and falling, and you are looking at your patient who is, sits here <laughs> with a broken rib. And so those workshops that are held are very helpful in helping people, though I say what happened to me could happen to a five-year-old, still we all need to be aware of the ways in which we can keep ourselves. Right, well. and so that is some of the information. We do ask about falls uh, on a routine yes. basis in all of our visits. And so again, it might be information you can think about because I think you people cannot really remember. It's not that they can't remember, but trying to say, gee, how many times did I fall this year? So mm -hmm. sometimes thinking about it ahead of time, expecting right. the question uh, is And maybe is writing it on your calendar. I took a fall today. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can come back and uh, Yeah, and trying to think that. about what the circumstances were right. when you fell, because it might make a big difference about whether it was just a trip that could happen to any of us, or if it was something more related to having a gait disturbance or uh, an underlying exactly. disease such as Parkinson's disease that has not been detected yet. So yes. that's very important. To very know, important to know to bring those forward things. the circumstances. Dr. Mm -hmm. Moody, we want to thank you so much. This has been so informative, and we hope that all of you will have gained some new knowledge about being with your doctor and talking with your doctor. We are doing a series with the various different people in the medical field. We hope you will join us for all of the episodes. Thank you.